Uh, hello, everyone. This is Gabane. Today, I've got a very exciting interview on our hands. We have with us the lovely Perry Robinson of Energetic uh, Procession. Um, I just want to say on uh, this particular guest, Perry has been uh, probably one of the most important mentors for me personally in terms of pointing me in the right direction, um, in terms of refusing to answer my questions directly, but teaching me how to answer these questions myself. And uh, I really don't think that um, I don't I don't think that I would uh, have been able to learn this kind of stuff without his help. So I'm very excited to have him today. And Perry, how are you doing? I'm uh, I'm okay. As I mentioned earlier, fighting a little bacterial bug, but it's nothing too serious. So <clears throat> I can't complain too much. Good. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where did you come from theologically? Um, when and how did you become Orthodox? And where have you gone since then? Um, so I guess, you know, you're asking kind of about my religious and educational background and that kind of stuff. So yeah. um, it Briefly, I was uh, baptized Roman Catholic as a child. I was raised in the Episcopal Church, and the Episcopal Church I was raised in was part of a series of Anglo-Catholic parishes that is very high church, very liturgical sacramental um, parishes that were a byproduct in my part of the world of the Oxford movement. And so I was an altar boy from the time I was around seven in the Episcopal Church. And we had plenty of smells and bells and incense and things like that. Um, you know, on Good Friday, we had a clacker. If you know what a clacker is for the uh, Good Friday um, the Western tradition. I don't actually know what a clacker is. Yeah, uh, it's actually kind of interesting. The It's only used on Good Friday. And the clacker is a strip of wood about that thick about two or about two inches wide about a half inch or an inch thick and it's got a uh, handle on the bottom and a wooden mallet on a swivel that goes back and forth and so as the procession goes into the church the acolyte swings it down and back up really fast and it makes this kind of hammering sound right whack whack really fast and so that is on Good Friday to bring to your attention the nailing of Christ to the cross. So um, high church Anglicans will, will recognize that or very traditional Roman Catholics. We also, I grew up with a monstrance. Um, so during Holy Week, so that gives you a kind of a flavor of the liturgical tradition that I was raised in. Um, in my teenage years when I knew everything and because of all kinds of things going on in the Episcopal Church, I, I spent some time in a non-denominational church and um, did that for a few years. And then I left that. I became Reformed. Uh, I was a member of the Reformed Episcopal Church for a number of years. So when you, were, when you grew up in, in, in Anglicanism, you didn't consider yourself a Reformed Anglican? It was more of a... Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, when I was... Um, when I was a very young teenager, um, and because of other things in my life, uh, it was important to me to find out if what I had been taught was true. And so um, I started out with a, you know, a TEV Bible with Apocrypha and a copy of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. So um, when I was around 13. So it was, went from Lewis, and, and when you're Anglican, Lewis is your guy, right? I mean, he, everybody knows Lewis. Everybody, everybody wishes they had Lewis. So I grew up on a steady diet of C.S. Lewis and, and other figures like that. Um, so when I became reformed, so when I was in raised in the Episcopal Church, um, I really wasn't aware of the Reformation other than as a historical event, the thing you learn about in junior high or, you know, things like that. Um, that didn't become significant for me later. It became significant for me when I was in the non-denominational body because of all the Keswick or higher life theology that they were pushing. So the non-denominational church was a product of the Jesus movement in California 
And so the Keswick movement was essentially um, in the 19th, early, I think early 20th century, very briefly was a, um, a movement, kind of revival movement, but focused on the spiritual life. And it ended up getting popularized in this kind of let go, let God um, slogan. So the idea was the more passive you became spiritually, the more open you were to God to be used and you would be therefore increase your sanctification and get quote unquote closer to God. And that works really well for um, some people. Um, so it, it generally creates two classes of people. It creates people who have a very low view of sin. They think of sin as an overt action and not as a thought um, or an inclination or a desire. Um, so it produces Pharisees, people who think they're actually pulling up, pulling off that getting closer to God thing because they're so good and wonderful and passive. Um, or it produces neurotics very quickly. And uh, I saw this in a non-denominational body I was in. Um, people became suicidal. People got baptized multiple times over and over and over and over again because they kept sinning. So they, that meant that they obviously had not given it all up to God and weren't letting go of things. So they needed to be baptized again. Is this so kind of is this kind of like the preparationism of Paul Washer? I'm not really. I I really try to ignore Mr. Washer. So <laughs> I really I really can't speak to that. Um, uh, there is a kind of preparationalism in Puritan theology at the time of Jonathan Edwards and things like that, but I, so I have no idea whether Mr. Washer is drawing on something that sophisticated, which I doubt, but <clears throat> that said, um, this, this was my experience, and so when, um, I'm, I started reading people like, um, I ran into J.I. Packer, R.C. Sproul, people like this, and so the Reformation doctrines were very cathartic. They were very important because they gave us a way out. Myself and a whole bunch of other people that gave us a way out of this kind of um, neurotic theology. And there were a lot of spiritual abuses in the leadership, too. They were very authoritarian. You know, oh, the Lord told me you, you should stay and you should do this. And and, and it was like, well, if the Lord told you, then you should have written it down and added it to the Bible. Um, because you're just using God to cover for whatever you actually want to have happen. So, and I was very active in, at that time, I was very active in counter cult apologetics. I was the How kind old of, were you at this point? Uh, this would be the ages of uh, between 14 and 18. Okay. So um, I was the kind of freak that, you know, other kids would be going like 15, 16 years old. They would be going to parties on Friday and Saturday night with things like they shouldn't be drinking. And I would go down to the local Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall with a buddy of mine and sit through their meetings. <clears throat> and then afterwards, we would witness to the people there. Um, I did the same thing with Mormon churches and Christian science reading rooms and things like this. Uh, I was... In retrospect, I was a little foolish. Uh, I was very fearless because I figured what's the worst they could do is, you know, kick me out, right? Um, so, uh, so I was very involved in apologetics. So the, all of the kind of anti-intellectualism and stuff in, in the non-denominational church um, and the Keswick stuff really drove me out and the Reformation traditions were much more appealing, uh, both on a personal level uh, and also on an intellectual level. So I joined the Reformed Episcopal Church, um, and I was a member of that for a number of years, and uh, I met, uh, at the time I met, um, who's now Father uh, Josiah Trenum, we were in, in the in the same general, more or less general area. Um, and he was Reformed at this time? Yes, he was. Okay. <clears throat> I believe he was a deacon. Um, up in Central California area. Deacon in a Reformed church. Yes, in the Reformed Episcopal Church. Okay. And um, so I'd say about halfway through my stay in Reformed land, um, well, to back up for a second, just to give people an idea, if you know who, like people like Kim Riddlebogger, Dad uh, Rosenblatt, Mike Horton, 
people like this. This was kind of the crew that, that I hung around, went to their lectures, things like this. I spent some time with Greg Bonson. Um, none of this is to say that I was like, like besties with Greg Bonson or something like that. I probably knew Mike Horton much better. Uh, same with Rosenblatt, people like this. But that was kind of the, gives people the flavor of people I was associated with, the circles I was in. Uh, so this would be in the in the 1990s. So about halfway through that, <clears throat> I started seeing problems historically and theologically with the reform paradigm. Um, problems with baptismal regeneration, Christ's real presence in the Eucharist, and probably apostolic succession was probably one of the biggest things, influences on me. And uh, one of the things, one of the principles that served me well, I believe it served me well, is to always try and read the best that the other side has to offer. And so while all my reformed friends were reading, you know, Warfield and Hodge and people like this, um, who are representative and, and certainly other reformed tradition is certainly not stupid people, uh, I wanted to read, well, well, who are the people on the other side? So when they were reading the Puritans, I was reading the Caroline Divines. So I was reading Thorndike and Hicks and people like this, Jeremy Taylor. And I started to notice, I'm like, hey, they, they've got some good arguments. This, this, these people aren't stupid. It wasn't these, uh, you know, stupid quasi, you know, Pope kissers or something like this in England. They actually had some good arguments for the sacerdotal ministry and apostolic succession. Were you on the internet at all at this point? This is the mid nineties, so yeah. So this was back when when the internet was new, and um, back in the olden days, uh, I started out uh, with a three hundred baud modem on bulletin board systems, and you would upload your message, and then you download you know somebody else's, and you'd write a response and upload it. Um, you know, a, a three hundred baud modem, you're watching it load like this right across the screen and then it went up to 1200 and then we went up to 14.4 and then people moved off of uh, bullet board systems to internet relay chat so emmerk which was real-time uh, discussion so i moved to that um so i was doing apologetics in person but also um online in the early 90s also incidentally i, I worked for the christian research institute uh, between 1990 and 1992, so that's also part of my history. Um, was, this, um, was it when? When did it stop being under Walter Martin? In 1989, um, okay. in the summer of 1989, Walter Martin died rather unexpectedly. Yeah, and uh, I believe of a heart attack at night in his sleep, and so I came in the following year after there had been something of a purge, and people can read about that stuff later um but so i spent time working there i worked with informally other uh parachurch quote unquote ministries um so i worked with a little bit with mike horton's cure christians united for reformation and um some other groups at the time so i was very active during during the 1990s um when, for example, they opened the new Mormon temple in San Diego, a number of us went down because they allow you to go through, walk through it, right? And of course, they're there to evangelize you. And so there's like 30 of us on a bus, literally driving down to San Diego. And we go through and I was the only person, unfortunately, that had the honor of getting escorted off the property. Um, the thing with, with Mormons is I've had both Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons over my house. Jehovah's Witnesses are kind of gung-ho about like, yeah, let's debate this out. But the Mormons are so nice that it's almost like, I, I don't want to you know, crush your soul right now by, by telling you that this is all false. Were they more aggressive at that point in time? Because I know things changed during like the, the, the presidency of, of Gordon Hinckley. Um, were they a little more intense about debating? I think because Mormonism is rooted at a personal level on a personal experience and centered around the family, they tend to be more concerned about niceties and personal feelings. The witnesses are centered around an appeal to reason. All their beliefs are reasonable, quote unquote. And so I think that explains the kind of sociological 
and psychological disposition that they have. Um, so I, I really can't say um, they escorted me off the property because I was asking too many questions at the end of the tour. And um, it was pretty obvious that I was a 16 year old kid there to try and convert them. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So that was kind of what I was doing, you know, to that whole time. Um, in any case, uh, so the reform paradigm started falling apart for me. And so um, what happened was in the mid 90s, there were a number of reformed Episcopal churches in my area, including Father Trenums and a few others, the one that I was at as well, where a number of the people decided to become Orthodox. And this was in reaction to, in part, the direction that the REC was taking, that they were going to go soft on certain things. Um, and so, but there were a lot of other issues. But in any case, I was uh, part of a small, very small group of, of friends who thought that Reformed theology had serious problems, but we weren't comfortable with becoming Orthodox because there were certain questions that had not been answered sufficiently for us. And so we went and joined one of the um, high church Anglican continuing bodies. And I spent some time in there and that's where I met my wife. Was it the ACNA by chance? No, it was not the ACNA. The ACNA I don't believe existed at that time. This was the, okay. at the time it was the Anglican Catholic Church, um, which is now split a couple different ways, unfortunately. Um, but was at that, that time... Was it High Church ahead. Reformed or was it no. Anglo-Catholic? No, it was Anglo-Catholic. Okay. So we were, it was not uncommon to see the Anglican Missal being used. Um so it went anywhere from broad church to high church. There was no reformed. Uh, they pledged allegiance via the affirmation of St. Louis, uh, which was a founding document of the continuing churches, uh, pledged allegiance to the seven ecumenical councils, which is kind of hard to do if you're reformed, especially that number seven. Was there um, devotion to the saints and Mary? I'm, I'm not familiar with the culture. And, and, and Yeah, it, it varied. Um, it varied from parish to parish because a lot of people were refugees from the Episcopal Church. And so it just depended on the priest and it depended on what their background was and what their, you know, what they were comfortable with. So yeah, there were parishes where you would go in and they would have side chapels to Theotokos um, and then their patron saint and things like this. And then um, there would be parishes that didn't have that. But a lot of it was kind of podunk because they were in, they were all in emergency mode. So when the affirmation of St. Louis was signed and the ECC was first formed, they had about 150,000 members, I believe, which is a good sized number of people to start with if you're gonna build a denomination. The problem is that it just fractured and there were all kinds of other problems. So I spent some time in there. I met my wife, got, got married. And um, so to, towards the end of the 1990s, uh, there were a certain set of problems. Um, that kind of all started coming together. I initially thought of them as separate problems that I was dealing with, uh, but it became clear to me over time that they were all interconnected. And one of the reasons I thought that they were inter interconnected was if I would fix one problem here and think, okay, I got that one fixed, it would then entail a change over here. And the problem would just move from one area to the other. So these were theological issues with respect to uh, divine simplicity, God's uh, foreknowledge and, and human freedom or the freedom of creaturely freedom, um, universalism, and um, so God, and also God's free creation. So creation ex nihilo is in, is in the boat. Um, so some of it started separately. For example, my thoughts on simplicity were motivated by creating internal critiques of other theological traditions like Islam. So if you read a little bit of Plotinus, for example, uh, Plotinus doesn't think that the one is capable of thought because thought requires a distinction uh, in plurality. So if you're absolutely one, thought is going to be impossible. Well, if you think of Allah like that, that might be a you might be on on to something in terms of thinking of an objection with respect to uh, Islam and, and other 
highly Unitarian uh, theological conceptions. By internal critique, are you referring to kind of the transcendental argument approach or because I know Greg Bonson has used that phrase internal critique. Um, is, is that kind of what you were doing or is it something else? Yeah, I was influenced by um, by that tradition, uh, by transcendental arguments, uh, mainly through people. I started out with reading people like Gordon Clark, who I don't think is really a presuppositionalist and really doesn't use transcendental arguments. I moved uh, from Clark to people like Van Til, read some John Frame, Greg Bonson, people like this, used to go to Bonson's lectures and things uh, locally. Um, and then I started getting into looking into transcendental Thomism because there's a whole school of Thomism that uses transcendental arguments and transcendental reasoning as well, um, which I know is a really big shock to people who are reformed and presuppositionalist to find out, oh my gosh, the Catholics were doing the same thing at the same time, you know, it's like, oh, they can't be taking our stuff. Um, but they were at the time of Antil, there were transcendental Thomists who were making arguments like that for God. So um, they're kind of on those parallel historical track. What, were, was there some mutual influence? Were they aware of each other or is this just some? I don't think that they were aware of each other. I believe that there was a lot of influence at that time around the turn of the century and a little bit after with the philosophy obviously of Immanuel Kant and then also Hegelianism. German idealism was still very dominant. Um, this is just the beginnings of, of um, Russell and Carnap and logical positivism structured as a, essentially a reaction to Hegelianism. So if you read Van Til's set of papers or a book called Christian and Idealism, or you read the stuff from Hermann Duiveerd, a new critique of theoretical thought, which is a massive four volume uh, work, it's very clear that they're dealing with Hegelianism and Kantianism and Neo-Kantianism. So I think there's just a lot of cross-pollination from those enlightenment traditions into both the Dutch Reformed, they, everybody has to deal with it. So, you know, there's only so many ways you can deal with a particular problem. So I think that that probably best explains why that school of Thomism was dealing with those issues, but. So you, you're, you're um, thinking about divine simplicity um, in relation to these um, apologetic issues, one might say, um, what's the road from there to orthodoxy? Yeah, the there were two there were two main issues. One was that I could see that the Anglican body I was in was probably not going to last. And you know, if you take apostolic succession seriously, if you take the apostolic ministry seriously, and you come down to um, a situation where if you have three bad coughs and a heart attack, and you don't have any bishops. Well, you know, that you're a true church in the apostolic ministry, that doesn't seem so plausible anymore. And your chances of, of creating, a, reviving a particular tradition are, seem really implausible. So there was, there was that as a motivating factor. Um, but also I came across uh, Maximus the Confessor. And at this time... Um, there was very, very little in English written on Maximus, either in terms of primary text or secondary. There was the work by Polycarp Sherwood, which uh, in, in terms of Sherwood's analysis of Maximus's critique of originism, but you would have to know exactly what to look for to find that. And there's von, von uh, Balthazar as well. Yeah, there's that. Uh, there are some other issues with Balthazar's take. Um, then there was also, I believe, the um, Finnish Lutheran, um, Lars Thunberg's work. But again, you have to know what to look for. So you have a few things and some smattering of articles and almost no primary text at all. Uh, you have the Paulus Press stuff uh, edition with the chapters on, I believe, chapters on love, the trial and things like that. Um, and then there's very little, even less on people like St. Gregory Palamas and, and others. So that put me in a position, once I started understanding what Maximus was dealing with in Christology, with the monothelite controversy, and in Originism, the issues of simplicity, uh, 
God's freedom in creation, Christ's freedom in the garden during the passion, the freedom of the saints in, in the eschaton, right? And how you reconcile that with impeccability. All of the, and all of these issues kind of came together and I could start to see things in, in a kind of a flash. I didn't have it all figured out, but like a constellation, I could see all the main points. Would you have, you, would you have uh, considered yourself while you were in the Anglo-Catholic Church or even while you were Reformed, would you have considered yourself Thomist or something else or nothing at all? Yeah, um, I would say in more in terms of influence and where I was generally at. Um, when I left the Reformed tradition, I thought of myself as being uh, Augustinian and committed to a more Augustinian vision, both in terms of epistemology and metaphysics and soteriology. And then I got very interested in um, John Dunn Scotus on freedom and foreknowledge. I moved from Scotus to Aquinas. There was a time, I, so I spent a lot of time devouring this literature of these particular people. And then I got interested in, from, uh, from that, I got interested in freedom and foreknowledge in the Occamistic and Franciscan tradition. So if you're interested in reading about what a hard fact is, as opposed to a soft fact, and how soft facts become hard facts and things like this, uh, that's the kind of things that you're interested in. Like, how do propositions about the future, how are those to be understood, and how could they be understood by God and things like this? And, really, and so that opens up issues of how to think about how to reconcile freedom and foreknowledge. We went to... Um, um... Father uh, Peter Damien Fellner at all? Because Jared Goff, who's into the Franciscan theological tradition, that's his that's his guy. Um, no, I'm not. I can't say that I that I am. So, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, I was more concentrated on either primary text, um, or either in contemporary analytic usage. So this was at a time when Planica, before Planica switched from Occamism to Molinism. And so there was a lot of discussion in the analytic uh, and in philosophy of religion in general about Occamism as a proposed solution to freedom and foreknowledge issues. Um, and would you just, um, what is the Occamist solution if you're able to state it briefly? Well, part, part of it at the time in terms of the discussion was concerned with how to understand propositions. And so the idea was that propositions about the past are over and done with, right? Because the state of affairs, uh, you can't change the past, it's completed. And so the past, propositions about the past have a certain kind of necessity that, um, that they express called per accidents, right? And so they, they weren't necessary before the event took place, but now the event has taken place and it's over and done with. And so um, that kind of proposition is now expressing a hard fact, something that's not changeable. But a proposition that is about the past, but also about something in the future that hasn't taken place, well, that's not expressing as a proposition a hard fact. That's expressing a soft fact. And so the idea in, in part was that God's uh, foreknowledge with respect to human freedom could be understood in something like that way. And there was a whole body of literature. John Martin Fisher has a really good book on this. It's a collection of essays called God, Freedom and Foreknowledge, I believe. Um, and there's there was a whole bunch of literature in the late 70s, early 80s, well, well into, I'd say the late 80s, early 90s. And then the shift to Molinism came about because they saw that Occamism wasn't gonna work. So, is there a point at which you know you consciously begin to perceive orthodoxy as a live option and um if there is such a point how long did it take for you to get from there to actually you know saying i'm going to become orthodox yeah this would be about 1997 so it was pretty clear to me that the kinds of answers that maximus was providing me um with respect to divine simplicity, the plurality of divine energies, the kind of freedom that the saints enjoyed in the eschaton as a kind of libertarian freedom, 
um, no Western tradition that I was ever familiar with gave these kinds of answers and opened these kinds of possibilities. So it was like, look, I had worked through all the major schools pretty much on this question. And it, as I said before, it didn't matter if I had fix it in one place, the same problem would show up in a different form, right? So to the degree that I, that I maximized God's perfection, I ended up weakening human freedom. Well, but since humans are made in God's image, that's going to have implications for your doctrine of God, right? And this was something that I learned when I was reformed is the degree to which you um, change your view of human nature is going to impact how you, how you view God because humans are made in God's image. So in any case, that was... I'd say about 1997 was the time that I was really looking at orthodoxy seriously. I was gobbling up Lossky, Meyendorf, uh, a lot of the usual suspects in, in that respect. Um, was, uh, was Florevsky and Staniloy among them? Not, not Staniloy till later, okay. um, but, but Florovsky was uh, definitely uh, an influence on me. And see, now that I had kind of Maximus's grid, I had a kind of Rosetta Stone. So I could take what I understood of a term in the Western theological tradition. And then now I, now I had that Rosetta Stone for Maximus say, ah, this is what it means over here, right? And that's part of the problem where people coming from a Western theological tradition, how, well, how do you understand grace? Because you're used to all of these technical terms or theological terms. How, how do you understand those in Eastern tradition? Now, there's a lot of overlap, but there are differences at key points. And so once I had Maximus's kind of Rosetta Stone, so to speak, I was able to make a lot more sense out of material from Lasky and Florovsky, Meindorf, and, and lots of other material. And I started going back and reading um, patristic texts, particularly on Christology and Trinity and things. And I saw things that I did not see before, right? Or, or I couldn't make sense of them appropriately at a you know, much earlier time. Um, so uh, at what point do you become Orthodox then? So we were still in the Anglican body uh, in 1997. In um, 2000, I was accepted to a graduate program out of state and there wasn't an Anglican body within about five hours of where we were going to be moving in terms of five hour drive. And so um, this was difficult because my, my wife's family was in that religious body too. And so there were some family issues there um, and they weren't going to understand the Oh, my husband has all of these interesting theological issues about freedom and foreknowledge and divine simplicity and things like this, and that that's, that wasn't going to fly. So, we had a practical reason uh, at that point that allowed us to uh, to convert. And I was much more sure after three years of study where I wanted to go. So in 2000, my wife and I were received um, into the Orthodox Church at that time into the Greek uh, Archdiocese. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's much more deliberate process, it seems, for you than it is for a lot of people. Um, but I mean, the consequence of that in part is 21 years later you know, you're still here um and yeah they haven't kicked me out yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um is anything i don't know intellectually theologically is there any systematic insight or, or change in your interpretive paradigm that you want to make note of since you became orthodox I think, I think I guess I would try to approach that question in the following way. I don't think the major things have changed. Uh, all of those major stars and constellation have stayed the same. I would say that I'm able to see more stars in the constellation now than I was, than I was able to before. Um, so, you know, it, it's not my fate. It's not, I, I didn't, I didn't create this thing, right? So there's always more to it. And I would say this, if people are considering orthodoxy, 
um, you're not going to figure it all out before you join. Number one, you're not going to figure out any particular worldview completely before you join it anyway. That's just the nature of human finitude and the way things are. So you're not going to, you're not, it's not like you're going to go, oh, well, I just won't be orthodox. I'll go be something else. And then I can figure out all this stuff and answer all these questions. It, it just doesn't work that way. Um, but I would say that um, you need to identify two, two sets of issues, theoretical issues and practical issues. And the theoretical issues you need to divide up and identify a few and treat them like deal breakers, right? So for me, apostolic succession was a deal breaker. If apostolic succession is true, Protestantism can't possibly be true, right? And you include Anglicanism in Protestantism, or is that kind of a? That's yeah. That's a that's a whole separate question, and to some extent, it's moot because Anglicanism is uh, and and the good that it had, unfortunately, is dissolving before our eyes culturally. But um, so that that's an individual. That's a longer story, but so for example, I mean, on the filioque way or the papacy or things like this, these are make or break issues um, in terms of whether you should be Orthodox or Catholic, right? Um, just to give an example. And you should identify a few of those and then you should take your time and read the best literature you can. And you should take a few years and, and do the best you can. And the reason is you wanna to come to a kind of settled judgment right, where you're not going, uh, uh, barring some new archaeological discovery, you're not going to be moved by somebody throwing some passage to you that you haven't read before or heard of or some argument, right? That's going to be good for you spiritually. It's going to be good for the people around you, especially if you're married and you have kids. You can't just be dragging kids from church to church every few years and changing your whole worldview. It's not good for them. It's not good for you. It's certainly not going to be good for your spouse. Um, on, on the practical side, I think you need to think about issues that you can live with and issues that you can't live with. Because there's going to be problems no matter where you go. And there's going to be things you don't like no matter where you go. That's just the way it is. So liturgically for me, one liturgically apart from the theological issues, um, one reason why Catholicism was not an option for me liturgically was I was raised in an Anglo-Catholic tradition that was very committed to doing the liturgy well. And I would go into the average Catholic parish and they're doing the Novus Ordo very badly. And when people don't know how to do a lavabo or when to ring the bells or these other things, and you have all these lay popesses up at the altar, uh, for lack of a better term, I mean, this is not something I can... For me, the way I was formed liturgically, that's not something that uh, that's a practical issue that I just couldn't, I just couldn't handle. Do you think that um, that that issue um, provides warrant for you to not become Catholic? Well, I'm just, I don't think of it that way, and I'm not bringing it to the table in terms of providing warrant. I'm just trying to give that as an example of practical problems that. I can stomach and practical problems that I can. I think the, all the warrant work really needs to be done on, or the vast majority of it on the theological side. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's interesting to me um, with respect to the question of how we pick our theological positions that Paul in Ephesians speaks about being tossed about by every wind of doctrine. And I kind of see this in light of the, um, injunction to become uh, impassable in the sense that you are impassive, in that you are increasingly uh, choosing to direct your mind here and there. It's not just that people are doing things to you and sticking things in your mind, but you, know, you might be deeply inclined to become Orthodox one day and Catholic the next day, but you have to kind of grab hold of that, become sovereign over it and think through. Uh, like it's, it doesn't matter how strong my intuition is on any given day. Um, you have to train that intuition um, uh, so that it actually is, is, is reliable and pointing you in the right direction. Um, and that, that's something which is very 
I think difficult to do. Um, and and people, I don't want to tell people don't become Orthodox. But if people say, um, "Oh well, a week ago I discovered Orthodoxy and I'm I'm gung ho about it now," it's like okay, like definitely keep looking into right. it. But if if this is something that is just stuck in your head and you become Orthodox because it's so powerfully exerting the, this uh, attraction on you, something else, whether it's uh, another faith tradition or whether it's women, will powerfully exert that attraction on you next week. <laughs> Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I would, I, I definitely understand what you, what you're talking about. I've had that kind of conversation with people. It's like, well, that's great. You're excited. Glad to have you all that kind of stuff. Take your time, be patient. You know, um, I think a good piece of advice was given to me by the priest, um, the, the Anglican priest that married my wife and I, when we were going through marriage counseling. And he required us to write down uh, three things we did not like about each other. And we're just like, why are we, why are you doing this, bro? Like, what's up with that? And so we did it. And, but it was a very good exercise. And it was a good exercise because when you're in a situation like that, you're, you're going through a kind of infatuation. And that's going to blind you to the realities that you're going to have to live with. And if you're intending in a marriage to be with that person till death do you part, well, you better look at all the warts. You can't let that infatuation blind you. Um, and I think similarly with respect to joining the church, I, I try to take conversion seriously. For example, I'm a big believer in the renunciations. I think for people being received by chrismation, the renunciations are important. They create a clean break for that person. And it's not easy. I know. I've done it. So I'm, I'm speaking from experience. But I think it's important. And I think it's important that people, before they're baptized or they're received by chrismation, to think about the things that they don't like about the church. Because you're going to live with them. And you, you need to be a realistic. And one thing I always tell people is there's no back door to Eden. Don't, don't treat the church like your secret back door to paradise. And now everything's going to be wonderful. And you're going to live on unicorn farts. And you're going to take communion. And you're going to glow in the dark. And, you know, um, mm -mm. Um, you know. That's not, that's not the real world. It's, at least it's not the world that I live in. So I think that infatuation, like it's great that you're happy to be Orthodox. But you need to look at this is your parish. These are the people you are going to have to deal with. That dude over there, he's nuts. You just need to be aware he's nuts. Bob is nuts. Okay? Um, this lady over there, like, Controlling the casseroles at coffee hour is her deal. That's her, that's her turf. Like, don't mess with that, right? I, I'm making stuff up, but this is real parish life. I mean, if you're in a parish, and especially if you're clergy, or you're on a, God help you, you're on parish council, but you're dealing with real people. And so I, I, I always want people to have a realistic picture of what it is that they're joining. Because I want them to last. Right? He who endures to the end shall be saved. Right? Yeah. 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 It's the, you know, the, the real work of being practically Orthodox and being practically Christian is not um, uh, uh, figuring out how to attain unceasing prayer. It's deciding whether you're going to give the finger to the guy who just cut you <laughs> off on the highway. I mean, that's where the real work is done. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, if, you, if you're tempted to extend the right fist of fellowship um, to your fellow parishioners, uh, you know, so I, you know, I think that it's good for catechumens and inquirers to realize that there's no, there's no back door to Eden. You're, you're not going to get away from the messiness of the world. You're still going to struggle with sin. Um, all of those things are going to be the case. 
Well, great. So um, if you don't have anything else you want to add on your personal story, uh, you want to move to the incarnation and talking about that? Yeah, what well, I mean, if, if we're good with that. Um, so with respect to the incarnation, what do you have in mind? Because um, you got to press the Perry button to get me to talk about. Oh no! Oh no! No, I get certain it. things. Yeah, yeah. So, um, why is the incarnation important, and how does this relate to the question of uh, uh, the unity of Christ's personhood, um, which has sent you know the orthosphere uh, all a Twitter over the past few years? Um, what would you say on that? Yeah, I think the incarnation in is important and like i think the doctrine of the trinity and the incarnation are the two core doctrines of christianity and the reason why they're important one of many reasons why they're important is because they do first they do something that greek philosophy really doesn't do so well um if at all which is to distinguish or have a distinct concept of person or at least go in that direction um it doesn't greek philosophy or hellenistic philosophy really doesn't do so hot of a job in explaining how there could be or if there could be a difference between a person and nature so in for a lot of philosophical systems in antiquity uh, a person is either a bundle of properties and then they have the question of well what unites the bundle right what constitutes its unity uh, or that there's some kind of metaphysical mixture and they're just an instance of a kind, like a, like a triangle is an instance of, of triangularity, right? So uh, a, a person is just that individual human being over there, Fred, right? Um, now that works fine if you're not Trinitarian. Um, but if you are, well, you have one God, but you have three persons. And so you're going to have to make that distinction between person and nature in a, in a way that avoids modalism or Sabellianism, such that God is just manifesting himself three different ways. But that's the distinctions are somehow really illusory um, in some way, or that they're separate beings, or that they're separate beings. Uh, hierarchically ordered in terms of degrees of being, like you would see in Arianism. And likewise in Christology, Christology kind of flips it around where um, you're, you're not so much arguing about unity, or at least unity in the same way, you're arguing about or trying to think about unity of the person relative to two natures. And so it's a different task. You have some of the same tools, but it's a different task and emphasis. Christology or the incarnation is really important because the categories that are established there, and this is what I learned early on, and I think you see this in other Orthodox figures like Vladimir Lossky, for example, in his discussions on Christology, uh, and Meindorf and Florovsky and plenty of other Orthodox thinkers. Um, as well as historical figures like John of Damascus, is that Christology gives you the grid in these concepts in terms of person and nature by which you then can interpret your sacramental theology or your ecclesiology, right? So those are the categories by which you then have to understand all these things. So I tell people, for example, with respect to say the Baptists, we have a different view of baptism than they do because we have a different Christology than they do. And the Baptists are doing the, you know, huh, what? Uh, we believe the same thing about Jesus. You know, no, not really. You can't have the same doctrine of baptism, right? And, um, and have a different Christology. And likewise, you can't have a different view of baptism and have the same Christology. Because you can't think of doctrine as a bunch of boxes. Not that you think of it this way, because Obi-Wan has trained you well. Uh, but it's a system that all the parts are interconnected. And you can't change one part of that system out without it rippling throughout the whole system 
and changing everything. It's a web, it's all interconnected. So Christology gives you those categories. So for example, many years ago, um, I was having a discussion with Catholics uh, and some Protestants, and they were trying to pin me with uh, some kind of, for lack of a better term, monergism, right? That God regenerates you um, apart from your will. And um, the Orthodox view was wrong. This was kind of what we were arguing about. And These they pointed Catholics to- Catholics who were saying this. Yeah, they were arguing that, that, our view, that our view was wrong, or at least the line that I was trying to defend. Okay. And um, that, for example, infant baptism and re baptismal regeneration was proof uh, that we were mistaken. And so I remembered a passage from St. Gregory Palamas' Treatise on the Spiritual Life. And he quotes uh, Diodocus of Photoki, right? And the distinction is drawn there between two gifts that are given in baptism, right? There's a gift according to nature, and then there's a gift according to person. And the gift according to nature operates at the level of, is operative at the level of nature when the person is baptized, at, when the child is baptized, and we're talking infant baptism. That does not spill over in terms of determining their will. The gift according to person, that we might say lays dormant or is activated when that child comes of age, so to speak, and engages it. And so you can see there the distinction, for example, person in nature that's operative in Christology is also structuring the sacramental theology, right? So um, if you're a predestinarian, you have a very strong doctrine of predestination, like the Catholics and the Protestants I was arguing with, they're gonna use, for example, Augustine's line on baptismal regeneration as a chief proof, as Augustine does, as a chief proof for, for predestination, right? Because the child is regenerated apart from their will. That was their argument. And my point was, well, no. And I pulled out my Diodocus of Potiki and typed that in and said, this is how it works. So that's why, one of the reasons why I spend so much time on Christology and the Trinity, because they're determinative for everything else. Yeah, it's, you know, everything that exists ultimately exists because it participates in one way or another in the triune life of God because he's God. Um, and the incarnation is that which sums up and redeems everything that exists. So everything that exists has to be rooted in one way or another in this sort of existence and in this sort of life, which is made manifest to us in the incarnate word. Um, so, you know, William Lane Craig, uh, who I know you've had some um, engagement with his thought on the incarnation, um, his argument for Apollinarianism. And for those who aren't aware, you know, uh, Apollinarianism is the idea that Jesus has a divine mind, but he does not have a human mind. And Craig is not shy about identifying with this particular heretical Christology. His argument is that if you have two complete natures, where everything that belongs to God is present in Christ, and absolutely everything that belongs to the human creature is also present in Christ, body and soul alike, then there's no principle, there's no category which can actually unite these two together um, such that it's meaningfully a single person, a single subject. What's your response to that? Um, because I think your response to this is going to tell us a lot about the question of personhood in general. Yeah, I think. The problem, part of the problem is that Craig is thinking that an individual and individuated human being must be a separate individual from the divine person. And so that there must be, therefore be two persons. And this is how he's thinking of the problem. The other part of the problem is Craig brings to the table kind of Cartesian dualism or substance dualism where for him, he begins with the assumption that the soul is the person. And this is true for J.P. Moreland as well. They both have the same position here. Um, DeWeese over at Biol also has a position. There's another few other, well, I think um, Wesley Jordan, I believe is another person, I'm not sure. But in any case, 
this is the assumption that they're starting with is that the soul is the person. And so they're trying to shoehorn Christi Christology into that. The problem is, is that the Christological models of antiquity, the conciliar models, um, don't think that the soul is the person. They think Jesus uh, is a divine person who has a human soul. And part of the problem is that we as Westerners have inherited a very Lockean notion of the mind as consciousness, as awareness. But this is not necessarily how people in antiquity during the time when the conciliar definitions were formulated are thinking of mind or conscious, um, thinking of mind. They're not thinking of it as uh, a stream of awareness is like John Locke does. They're thinking of the mind as a power of the soul that the person uses or avails themselves of that they utilize. And they think of the will the same way. And so this is part of the problem. Uh, I would say that Craig needs to get rid of that Cartesian assumption or that substance dualist assumption. And also the recognition that while Jesus is an individual man, right, he's that man over there if you're in Nazareth at that time, right? You can see him, right? He's, he's not like this amorphous blob of humanity or something like that. Uh, he is that man. He's an individual man, and he's an individuated man. But that doesn't preclude that it's the divine person that's in doing the individuating, that's doing providing the principle of unity for his humanity and for the union between the two natures. And so that, I think, is, is part of the problem um, with Craig's account. And with what you alluded to before, you know, there's there's some language. Um, the way that uh, some of this mess got started in the in the orthosphere, so to speak, on Christology, and I won't go into all the dirty details, um, but there's language of Jesus being a human and divine person. All right. Um, that language is in, as you well know, in contemporary theological discourse, in Protestant discourse, Catholic discourse. Um, it tends to be very recent, late 19th century, early 20th century, with the advent of psychology, with the influence of Hegelianism, um, the idea of world historical individuals and things like this, um, and bridging the gap between Geist and the world. Um, all of those issues are, are influencing modern theological discourse. Um, and also that phraseology of human and divine person also has, uh, that can be used by other theological models. Okay. So for example, an historian would be very happy with that language, right? So the um, language of divine human person. Yeah. Divine human person. So divine hyphen human person. Right. So the problem is, is, well, what does that term mean? Exactly. What does it mean? Because the Nestorians can use it. The Calvinists with their Nestorianizing Christology can definitely use it and have used it. Um, it's in the Westminster Confession. Um, the Monophysites could possibly use it. Um, the Lutherans could, could possibly use it. It shows up in some Lutheran sources as well. Um, so the question is, what, what does the term mean? Now, as far as I'm concerned, the term means in line with Chalcedonian Christology, which is a compositional account, where generally you're thinking of the whole and the parts. The whole is the person. The parts are the natures that the person has, okay, to which he is united. He's not reducible to those natures. But the natures are truly his, and there's not an extrinsic relationship between them. It's not like him, as Nestorius said, it's not like, you know, Nestorius would say Christ put on human nature like a coat or a jacket. It's not, it's not like that. It's, it's not an extrinsic relation. So the problem is, is for the people who are using this terminology to explain what they mean by it. And I haven't found any explanation. There's no cashing out of what this is supposed to mean, um, which is, because it ends up in so many different theological and conflicting models, many of which are, from an orthodox point of view, heretical, um, 
I, I need to know what that means. Because if it doesn't mean that the whole, which unites human nature to itself, um, if it doesn't mean that kind of compositional model, then we have a problem. If, it, if that's all it means, well, I don't have a problem with the language. But you always have to be careful, especially in a modern context, of using terms, I mean, if you talk with it, if, if you talk with Bruce McCormick, for example, who's a, a reformed Bardian scholar, and he's written on this Christological issue, and you talk to him about, oh yeah, Jesus is a divine human person. He's gonna mean something very different than what you mean, right? So um, my understanding is that the whole, is the divine person of God, the word, who never comes into existence. There never was a time, right, when the son was not, right? So for me, the question is what unites the natures? Since it's not an essential union, it's a hypostatic union, then the hypostasis isn't the nature. It's not reducible to the nature. There's something else. However we want to gloss that, the hypostasis or the person is something distinct in a way from the natures. Because otherwise you're left with just two instances of a natures getting smushed together in some kind of crude Eutychianism. And that's certainly not our view. Um, and, you know, I should say that this, this position that I'm expressing is not an East-West divide. It's not a division between us and Rome. It, if it were, number one, we would have been fighting about it already. There's that, because we fought about plenty of other things. This is, there's no division here uh, between Chalcedonians, whether East or West. Um, there's a division maybe between the cops and us on this, or the um, Assyrians and us on this, the Reformed and us on this, or the Lutherans. Uh, on this as well. But in terms of Christ being um, an eternal person and not, not a human person. Now, let's be clear. When I say Christ is not a human person, I'm not saying that Christ is not a human individual. I'm not saying he's not a man. I'm, I'm affirming he's a man. But as John of Damascus makes clear, it's true that while well, every hypostasis, um, excuse me, every nature has to have a hypostasis, it doesn't have to have a hypostasis of that nature. So God, the word, is the hypostasis to the human humanity of Christ. Which is just to say there's no human subsistence or human person in Christ. Now, if you want to use person in a wider sense that we properly do in English, uh, person is just an individual human being, okay, fine. But that's not what we're talking about, right? So the, the concept is, is much more refined and, and, and precise. So in my mind, until there's an actual position on the table expressed by people who are really attached and make these kind of not nice things about me and things like this, until there's a position on the table, there's nothing for me to engage in. Yeah, so I mean, um the way that I've kind of thought about it, and you can tell me to buzz off if this is uh, incorrect or mistaken. Oh, well, you know that I will in love, right? Yeah. You know, I, mean, so. I don't need to give you permission. <laughs> no. Is that, you know, there are three distinct ways in which God is God. So God is God in a paternal or fatherly way. God is God in a filial or son-like way. Um, and God is God in a spiritual way. So these are the three patterns of, of existence. Um, uh, in which and according to which God is himself, three rhythms of being, you could say, um, and the way in which the only begotten son is God, uh, the way which uh, filters every one of his perfections, um, it is that very pattern or rhythm of existence which filters his human existence as well. Um, and um, one thing which I've thought this might help explain is what it means for uh, uh, God to have prepared 
the human family for the incarnation by bringing forth the Theotokos, because this would indicate if the um, individuating principle of the nature is the divine sonship, uh, and it's that divine sonship which individuates the human nature, he can't become incarnate through just anybody. There needs to be a very specific set of circumstances which hold true in order for this to be made ontologically possible in the first place. W would you agree with that? Yeah, uh, generally, I would say that the language of rhythm or mode and things like this, they're, they're fine, but they need to be highly qualified, uh, especially, you know, you're in graduate school, you're in, you know, in theology and things like this. And so you're used to talking in, in a certain environment. But with the average parishioner or the average person outside the church, they're going to hear modalism, right, with that kind of language. So as long as the language is highly qualified, I mean, the, the Cappadocian fathers do talk about the um, persons as in terms of modes, right? That, that language is there. That concept is expressed. It's not a Sibelian conception of, of, mod of modes, um, but ways of being, which in, which in part that language is taken over from the Aristotelian critique of Parmenides, right? In answer to Parmenides, where Parmenides thinks that there's no individuating principle for being, which is why everything has to be one and you can never get to the liquor store because everything is one. There's no distance to traverse, which is really inconvenient. Um, but, and Aristotle, of course, says, well, there's ways of being, right? So there may not be an individuating principle in terms of nothing, but there are ways of being. And so the language of ways of being or modes is fine, and that's picked up from the Cappadocians. So as long as we qualify that, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, you know, dealing with the Theotokos and the incarnation um, is, is very, for me, existentially, it's, it's kind of personal um, in a weird devotional kind of way that I don't. I, and you know me, we've known each other long enough. You know I don't get all like gushy and stuff. I don't, I don't like the gushy stuff. So... To say so I'll, just, I'll just yeah I'll just put that I'll just put that to the side. Um, I do believe the way that I in the way that I think of the Old Testament and the use of the law um, with respect to the Theotokos is a kind of purifying process. God is cultivating a people for Himself, and and the Theotokos is is the end of that process, right? That she is. She is the, 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 the true bride of Israel. She encapsulates Israel in that way, right? She's the, she's the cultivation, the culmination of, of that refining process um, with, the, with the law. And so I, so I think you're, you're, you're definitely at least onto something there. I think that's the right way to think about it. Um, I mean... I'm never going to be God and become incarnate. So, I mean, we're all limited, right, in that way. But, I mean, when you think of Israel as this tiny little nation at the intersection of all of these empires, and it gets, you know, walked all over uh, by the Egyptians and the Romans and the Babylonians and the Persians and all of these other things. And, and, and yet it has this tremendous influence in world history, entirely disproportionate to its, it, its geopolitical size, even its strategic location in the Mediterranean. I mean, it's important in that way. Um, like you, if you wanna beat up Egypt and you're coming from you know, the ancient Near East, you gotta go through there to give Egypt a bloody nose and vice versa, but it's not that important, right? So, um, you know, I, I, so th that's the way that I think of the Old Testament and, and that question with respect to the, the Theotokos. Yeah, I mean, um, this is kind of tangentially uh, related. You know, Jesus talks about um, the wheat and the tares growing up together. Um, and if you look at Isaiah 6, which Jesus takes as programmatic for his own ministry, the word of God has this um, uh, active influence on the nation. And it seems to me that it does two things. It creates, it cultivates a people who are prepared to receive the incarnate word, the preeminent one, uh, being the Theotokos, but on the other hand, it also cultivates a people who, um, 
in whom evil is so mature that when God comes into the world, they crucify him. Um, and uh, I, I think that gives a heft to, you know, Peter says in, in Acts that this happened according to the definite plan of foreknowledge of God, which is very much like what Joseph says, you meant it for evil, for God meant it for good. This is quoted as kind of uh, an, by Calvinists and other predestinarians as a just an expression of how God manages history. But it seems to me that it has a lot more specificity um, than that. Um, in Romans 7, uh, you know, uh, the law came to make sin sinful beyond all measure so that God might condemn sin in the flesh of Christ. Um, it seems like a, a lot is going on there. Um, uh, one other way that, that uh, I've kind of thought of the individuating significance of, of, of personhood is uh, in saying that we don't have this set of human properties and then these set of individuating properties. It's not like I have certain things which make me a human being and then certain things which make me Sarah Hamilton or which make me Cobain. It's rather that my entire humanity gets filtered through what makes me distinct. Um, so there's nothing which is just vaguely or generically human. Um, everything which I have in common with the whole human family is filtered through these particularizing filters. And, uh, and the particularizing filter of Christ's um, humanity is this eternal way of being. Would you roll with that? Yeah, I mean, part of the problem, and this is how I think about it. In, in philosophy, and my background is in philosophy, there's, at least as far as I know, there's no consensus or anything like consensus on what constitutes a person. They're just, it's a complete and utter mess. Um, not that there's a lot of consensus on anything in philosophy, but personhood, um, yeah, no, you, I don't think you're gonna, you're gonna find that. My view is that when you have either essentialist or substantialist, substantialist metaphysics, like you do in antiquity, um, they do really well with objects. They do well with stuffs. They do well with parts, um, or at least highly intuitively well. Maybe there are other philosophical issues, you know, and the issues of the problem of material constitution. We talk about the ship of Theseus and all that stuff. But when it comes to persons, they don't do so well. When you try to reduce a person to an object, they, it doesn't do so well. Um, in, in the other direction, existentialist thought, I don't, I don't think does well with person at all because their answer is pretty much, oh yeah, it's nothing. Well, that's not satisfying. That doesn't seem to do really any philosophical work for us. Um, it's very nihilating to, to kind of wax Sartrean. Um, so I don't, my view is we don't have a, a hard and vast definition of person. And one of the reasons we don't is I really don't think that that's possible. I think persons are unique. They're not stuffs. They're not objects like other things are objects, which is why they are so good at resisting explanation. So as, as one of my instructors used to say is, there are no, it's the reason why there are no laws in psychology, right? So if there were laws in psychology, you could just plug in all of the data, assuming you could get all the data, run, run the calculus with the laws of psychology, and that would tell you what the person was going to do with absolute accuracy. It doesn't work like that. A person can always surprise you, right? Um, and for people who might be tempted by mind brain identity theses from the 1960s or other silly things like that. I'd highly recommend going reading some Jaguar Kim and all the multi-realization arguments about why mind and brain can't be identical or reducible to each other. So my view is we can have a kind of penumbral understanding of person. We can denote the point it's that it's that thing over there, right? Okay. Um, and we can kind of get at things that are around what it is to be a person. But penetrating that um, in terms of giving a definition in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions, I don't, philosophically, I don't think that, that that's ever going to be possible. 
So if, let me see if I understand you correctly. It's, since a since person is what particularizes or makes um, a, an instance of a nature um, or certain natures irreducibly themselves, it's just a self-contradiction to, in principle, be able to give a generic definition for what is, by definition, not generic. Or but yeah, I think I think I think that's on the right track. Okay. Okay. Um, so I just don't think it's the kind of reality that that's definable in, in that way. Um, so I'm sure God knows what it is to be a person. I'm sure, but I'm not sure that God could explain it to me. Uh, and I'm not sure that God could explain it to anybody else that's not God. Um, now, I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. Um, but... And I'm not alone philosophically in this. So, I mean, if I'm wrong, it's not because some, some moron like myself or something came up with it. There are other philosophers who think this way. Um, and you see this, for example, uh, I think Richard Cross has intuitions like this. If you look at his material on the uh, scholastic ways of cashing out the incarnation in his book, The Metaphysics of the Incarnation, um, he kind of goes in that direction. Now he's he's different than me, and he's really a great scholar, but he's much more of a Scotist, for example, in Christology um, than I am, uh, which is to say I'm not a Scotist. So I want to ask just one more question about personhood, and then you know I'll make this like a, a point where I'm going to split the video into two, and I'll upload it in two parts, but we'll, we'll do it in one session. Um, so... Uh, I got this question on the phone the other day um, and I wanted to get your take on it. Um, you know, we talk about maleness and femaleness as, you know, these are personal characteristics. A man and a woman are both instances of human nature. And yet it seems there is something that it is to be male, which unifies, you know, half the human family. What category does, or like um, you have, we're all sons of God. So clearly it's not something which is making me, irreducibly me. How do you categorize it or make that intelligible? How do I understand well, let, sexual let, dimorphism or well, just how that relates to personal identity or personhood? But there are things that multiple persons share as part of their personal mode of particularization but it's shared by multiple persons and i don't think we want to say that maleness means you know something irreducibly different for every male so there's nothing that unifies maleness but we right. don't want to say that there's a male nature um because there's a human nature um is there a pre-existing category which we can kind of slot this into i don't i don't know that there is um i mean just off the cuff i would think of it i mean very casually in terms of there are certain properties that human nature has. That might be one way of talking about it. Um, or there are certain ways, certain properties that human nature can have. This comes to bear on the issue of ordination, on why only males can be ordained. I've written a little bit about that. There was a piece I did a long time ago called The Christology of Feminism, where I think feminism, feminist theologians who make an argument about ordination um, in order to buttress the case for women's ordination, I think they end up in a form of Nestorianism where um, there's the male Jesus and then there's the Jesus who's this generic human, right? Um, and they have that. And so that's where that problem shows up uh, in part. Um, my view tends to be somewhat more, I would hope and think biblically informed um, in terms of the, the Pauline material and the material in Genesis and elsewhere, that, uh, that there's a kind of integrative and derivative relationship between male and female. And so that Christ being male incorporates all the women, so to speak, with respect to human nature, which is why they get raised from the dead, like with all the other men do. So with respect to the philosophical issue of how to understand um, particulars and universals, uh, that is an incredibly complicated issue. 
Um, so I'm probably going to punt on that because there's just there's just a ton of literature on the problem of universals and particularization. Theologically, though, um, I'm committed to the idea that Christ was male, and I'm committed to a male-only um, sacerdotal ministry because that's what Christ instituted. Um, I also do think that there are things about ourselves and sexual dimorphism that we only catch glimpses of, that we're really not, one, one of my, but let me put it to the, this way. One of my favorite, my favorite film in the world is um, The Ninth Configuration. William Peter Blatty's The Ninth Configuration. And there's a line in there where the main, one of the main characters says to one of the other main characters, he says, he says, who are you? He says, you're too human to be human, right? And because the main character is somebody who's kind of, in a, in a very incarnational way, he's in an insane asylum and he's the doctor, but he's also insane. And so he's coming to bear on the problem of mental illness in a way that none of the other health professionals had ever seen before. And it, it kind of takes that outside view of human nature to really tell us what we are. We can't, we really can't see ourselves from the, because we're on the inside. And so I think there are things about sexual dimorphism um, and sexual differentiation and its relationship to human nature that we may not be in a position to, to really see or understand. I think we get glimpses of it. What we see, we see it when it goes wrong, right? We, we, we see it at a very intuitive level, for example, when you deal with the abuse of children and things like this. Like that stuff just comes right to the surface and you're like, whoa, that's like way wrong. Oh, hell no, right? But defining it, that's, that's very, that's, I'm not sure that we're in a position to be able to do that. Maybe I'm wrong. But that's not my area of specialization or study or anything like that. So I'm just giving you kind of my intuitions, kind of how it seems things seem to me. Uh, okay, so uh, the next part of this interview we will have up uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Uh, so we will see you then.